Hello and welcome to Nagaland News Network. Today we are here with our renowned guest. He is none other than Mr. KK Sema, retired IS and a social activist himself. We are here today to discuss multiple issues happening in our state, Nagaland. And as we go and have a conversation with him, come join us as we get to know his opinions regarding different issues happening in our state, Nagaland. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for joining with us. Uh, yep. First of all, I would like to talk about uh, the Naga solution. So we have been, as in the Nagas have, the Nagas in general have been eagerly waiting for the Naga solution. So, and then there are also talks that, that the, the Naga solution will be here before Christmas or before the elections. So what is your opinion regarding solution before election? Will it happen? Well, uh, it's not for me to say whether it'll happen or not. But the important thing that the Nagas must uh, keep in mind is that in the last election, the campaign that was perpetuated was to have uh, the election so that we can have a solution. Now, five years are elapsing, and the uh, solution is nowhere near the horizon, as we can see. And uh, I think uh, the people of Naglin is being taken for a ride for much too long. This is now on the 76th year of uh, the struggle that has begun, and uh, Nagas in general have suffered immensely over these uh, 76 years. It's about time that the government of India also takes cognizance of the severity of the people, not only in terms of the burdens of taxes, the harassment, the fear, psychosis, and everything that is negative for a healthy living, has been going on for this so many years with one kind of political promises or the other solutions that were attempted before have all fallen from the main road and uh, unilaterally the government of India has been uh, discarding all the past agreements and uh, not upholding whatever has been already agreed upon as well. And so I think, I think the government of India also wants to see exactly what is the complete resolve of the total masses and the population of the Nagas to come up in unison to say that it's about time that the government of India takes cognizance, respect the difficulties that are being suffered by the people on a routine base, and, and uh, have the concern to solve the issues that is honorably acceptable to everybody, both for the government of India as much as for the people of Nagaland and uh, Nagas elsewhere. Now, it is difficult to say whether a solution will happen before the election. And uh, I think in some respect, the people themselves ought to be able to stand up together and say, since the promise has been made that elections will be held so that solutions can be arrived at, now I think that promise has still not been fulfilled. I think it is incumbent upon the uh, government of India to ensure that that promise given by the BJP is actually implemented and that they should be able to give some kind of a finality to this long struggle that has been ongoing and, uh, and give us this solution before the election and the people ought to stand up together and, and say so to the government of India and say we want the solution now and refuse to participate in the, in the elections. But as you know, it has already been tried out before when uh, the Naga political parties, the, uh, the state political parties, had decided to boycott the election, the Congress violated it, and then they became the, the majority, or the, in fact the only people that went for the election were all the other parties. You see, this kind of letting down one another, but 
at the end of the day, it is letting down the Naga's aspiration as a whole. Now, if the, all the political parties can actually honorably stand up, if they are really concerned for the people, to collectively stand up and request the government of India to give us a solution before the election is held or else postpone the election if required, but the solution must be given. And as long as the people of Nagaland and Mass put up some kind of a front aggressively, I think the government of India is never going to be looking at the problems of the Nagas as an important matter that needs attention urgently. And so I suppose we have to leave it to the government of India and also the people of Nagaland and the political parties to come collectively into some kind of a forum where government of India can sit up and notice what we are asking for. I think that's about the way it is. Otherwise, there's no definitive way we can say that solution will come before the election. We have to work for it. So uh, what do you think is the biggest uh, stumbling block at this age? I mean, at this stage? You see, in as far as the government of India is concerned, by 2019, they have already made a very unambiguous declaration that all issues have been tackled that the issue of sovereignty and integration were not part of the final solution and that it has to be gradually through democratic process sorted out. And so when all other issues other than the issue of sovereignty and integration has been uh, agreed upon, you see, we ought to have actually arrived at some kind of a conclusion already by 2019. But here, there is no hiding the fact where the NNPGs have already uh, come to some certain conclusion to say that we are now reasonably happy with whatever we have asked the government of India. But as far as the NSA and I is concerned, even they have, by 2019, agreed on the broad perimeters of uh, a, a solution, agreed upon, discussed and agreed upon. But out of nowhere, they've come out with the constitution, the flag, and the constitution, flag. And uh, now they are adamantly sticking to that issues that have come up after it was considered that all the issues have been thoroughly covered. This issue has come up, and this is perhaps the only stumbling block that is now on the road for the solution from being concluded. They want a flag, they want a Yezabo. Now here, I think uh, the Nagas must understand that this sentiment, sentiment about the flag, the sentiment about sovereignty, all these are past sentiments that we have lived by and we have tried our hardest, sacrificed so much. And so to that extent, our mental and emotional feelings are all tied up to the issue of sovereignty. And therefore, when you talk of sovereignty, naturally a flag is a part of that sovereign status. Now here, when the issue of sovereignty, even the NSA and I am with the people like uh, Mr. Muiva having declared that sovereignty is not going to be achievable, but they are talking about shared sovereignty. Shared sovereignty is not a complete sovereign state. Now, why should we, if NSE and I claims that the Nagas are going to be an independent nation, then why is the need for NSE and I to be asking for a flag? A sovereign nation, it is a protocol huh? that the state or, or the, any given nation is entitled to have a, a flag. We do not have to request anybody for uh, permission to give us a flag. See, so here is a contradiction. They talk about sovereignty as if uh, they have achieved sovereignty, but yet, on the other hand, they are asking for a flag. Hmm? 
If it is a sovereign nation, the flag is something that comes with it. Constitution is also a part of that uh, equation. And so when, when you say we are a sovereign nation, then the flag and the constitution is something we do not have to ask anybody about. The nation builds up its own constitution. The nation build, hoists its own flag. But the fact that they have failed to gain full sovereignty reduces all of these uh, national dressing kind of a thing, eh? the emblems. You see, it doesn't apply anymore. You see? So when you do not have a full sovereignty, what is the use of having a flag that is to be used for cultural purposes or for any other. You see, even the, our students' union have flags. NGOs that get formed every other minute have a flag. Hmm? And so why reduce ourselves to having that kind of a flag that is as common as any other NGOs? Hmm? Why the hell should we be asking for an NGO flag? Hmm? It's not a national flag. And so... You see, making such an issue as a stumbling block for a final solution for so many years people have suffered. I think these sentimental uh, picture that they want to paint, and the Nagas are also so divided in our inability to clearly see the whole situation, and, uh, and uh, howling for the flag, and the Yezabo, you see, Yezabo, in the sense, whatever is agreed upon, I think the government of India and even the NSC and I and the uh, national workers have come to some kind of an understanding, apparently, that it, the, the competency clauses or the demands that have been otherwise agreed upon can become a part of the Indian constitution under the definition of a Naga Yazabo, maybe. Similar to that, you know, you can change, uh, you can use any kind of a vocabulary to describe one thing or the other, you see. It is just another way of expanding and making Article 371A more clearer in its application so that there is no ambiguity, there is no confusion. And so Article 371A in the Indian Constitution is more like the Yezabo of the Nagas, hmm? where the Indian Parliament has no say over certain subject matters that are in terms of cultural, religion, traditions, and so on and so forth, and the resources. So this is more or less the kind of things that uh, get reflected and as long as our identity, as long as our resources, as long as our freedom is given in an, an undisturbed way, I think uh, the Nagas ought to be ready to go into those kind of uh, equations where we look at ourselves with the peace that would prevail within which the generations can catch up with the rest of the world. We are far, far behind the rest of the world, and it's not as if our young children or the, the young generation are not competent. They are it, brilliant people. With all the handicaps, our younger generations are exploding in the horizon with so very many talents now slowly but surely getting into various uh, national or international arenas. You see, had we had the peace and the tranquility to be able to exercise our intellect in the fullest manner in a peaceful environment, you see, there would have been bigger infrastructure, bigger opportunities, and our children, our, our young generation, would be well equal to that of the uh, Indian nation, and they would be able to compete in the world scenario as well, you see. But we are handicapped and we are well behind others, basically because of all this unhealthy environment of uh, uh, violence, threats, gun culture, and taxations, and various things where people find it very, very difficult to grow. And so I think... Uh, the Nagas must now begin to look at this whole 
proposition of the flag and the uh, Yazabo becoming the stumbling block, we have to pay attention to this and seriously analyze whether it is a worthy demand or not in the absence of sovereignty and in the absence of integration. So that's it. So uh, talking about the NNPGs, the NNPGs and the NSCN has formed a Council of Reconciliation. Uh, Naga, as in former Council of Naga Relationships and Cooperation. So according to you, how will this help in the issue of the Naga settlement? You see, in fact, I think the FNR has done a marvelous job in being able to bring the, uh, the national workers together on a same platform for the, I mean, for some constructive, interactive uh, environment. And I think this is a very critical need. I applaud FNR for the efforts they have put in. And I also congratulate the, the national workers for coming to some sensible conclusions that the issues concerning the Nagas are just not a sectoral issue. It is not meant for one faction or the other. They must see that this Naga issue is an issue that has to be for all Nagas within the state of Nagaland and outside the state. And what are the norms, what are the manner in which we can take cognizance of the well-being of all the Nagas living everywhere else? It is something that this kind of a forum can well analyze because both sides have put their demands. Now it is for the NSA and I to now openly put their competency clauses on the table along with the NNPGs putting theirs on the table and find out which are the issues that are detrimental for the Nagas as a whole, which are not going to be fair for the Nagas of Nagaland. And so when they sit together and honestly want to resolve the issue, this is possible as long as they have a forum. And so FNR having given them that opportunity and the forum, I would hope and, uh, and pray that uh, something positive will come out of this because at the end of the day, when we ourselves are divided in our thoughts, in our uh, application, in our actions, you see, our division is part of the reason why the government of India is finding it awfully difficult to make some firm decision because so many objections and criticalities keep emerging with every given issue. So when the common ground is found by the factions, I think the total population would be more than happy to uh, bless it and stand by it. And therefore, I hope FNR can take this uh, effort further and to have uh, a purposeful meeting of the NNPGs and the NSC and IM and find the middle way within which they can together go to the government of India and say, we all, the factions, all the national workers have now finally come to one concrete points of view for the government of India to take note of. And I'm sure once they do this, the government of India would ha not hesitate because then there would be no factions uh, overflow to continue this uh, struggle. And uh, I think I can only hope that uh, this particular recent development, which is a very, very positive uh, development, can go forward and bear fruits and I wish them all the best. It is no surprise to the public that the government of Nagaland has been working hand in glove with the NSN IM. So why, according to you, uh, is the delay, is all the delay for a settlement? Well, you see, it's a, it's a, a question that is uh, not possible to be given in a very concrete way as to why, but you see, in an overview, the NSA and IM faction, up to this point in time, have been making every effort to slow down the process. 
The state government also only talks about themselves being facilitators and that uh, they are facilitating nothing, using that in a, as an excuse to have an oppositionless government, using that as an excuse for everything. But delay is something that even the political leaders in the uh, state of Nagaland are not particularly anxious to have as a final solution. They gain by this prolonged lack of solution because they are comfortably involved with making money through government machineries and through their status. And so when NSE and I can continue taxing the people without any breaks, with nobody to control them, and the state government using the uh, uh, unsettled environment to continue be in power through all corrupt means and continue with their process of collecting wealth for themselves as much as for the political parties they are in. And uh, they are quite happy that if solution comes, there will be a lot of uh, screening in which uh, whether it is the underground or the national workers or even the state government, there will be a lot of uh, uh, analysis as to who has done what. The corruptive system and who has gained all of these issues will one day or the other emerge. And all of them will be answerable. Hmm? Be it the national workers, they have collected over the decades all the illegal taxation and they have built up their own personal empires. In the political scenario of the state, it is the same thing with all the political leaders becoming the rock star corrupt. You know, they have made uh, corruption a kind of uh, a style. Hmm? And uh, there is no longer any kind of a feeling that corruption is not the right approach to a management. You see? But everybody is quite happy with the way it is. The corruptive system is being prolonged and that serves their purpose. So both the NSC and I and the state government are comfortable in the solution not being brought. This is an, a very common kind of a perception that the people in Nagaland, as elsewhere, have come to feel all this while that the state government definitely has let the people down for this many years and only parroting the responsibility as a facilitator and they have facilitated nothing. They have not generated the mental setup of how the people can be helped to decide you know, and build up a common platform, common stand so that the government of India can also see that the people of Nagaland and the people of uh, Nagas elsewhere all are having a common final goal that they want to achieve. And so if the state government were actually uh, sincere, there are a whole range of activities that they could have done in order to support the national movement and let the government of India see that all Nagas are standing up together for a final solution. This is not happening, and so that's the way it is. They are happy. They are comfortable in not having a solution. Uh, talking about the present government, with so many MLAs that joined NDPP, how do you think uh, our CM Rio will accommodate all of them, considering it is a 40 to 20 seat sharing? There will be a whole lot of MLAs running around joining one party or the other at the end of the day when the election is uh, declared. And I think uh, that's something that the Nagas are going to see. So uh, talking about NLDP Act, you know, like, do you think the NPCC has the right to be the topmost advisor on this issue? And also, why is the government likes about it? Look, I think this is a thoroughly debated subject matter for the last so very many years. And we are all skirting around without being able to really come to ground reality situation here. 
that we are living a hypocritical life is absolutely clear. I have said again and again that right from the chief minister's office down to the peons and chokidas, when they have a party, liquor is part of a party. Hmm? And the chief minister knows this. The whole government, the whole people, and the, uh, that's the reason why Nagaland is known as the wettest dry state. Hmm? It is not working. And yet, despite the fact of that reality being absolutely and thoroughly clear, NBCC is still pushing the same thing. You see, the churches have been the force behind prohibitions, and nations like America, they have tried it out, and those were also created through the pressures of the, of the churches. And uh, when they applied it, they couldn't do anything. In fact, more than the government could handle, the mafia system came up, and the government of uh, America, they are also still struggling with the, the illegal mafias in their country. These were created through the very fundamental principles application of uh, the NLTP. Not NLTP, but the prohibition. And so when lessons have been learned by others, we should be intelligent enough to see exactly how history has evolved, where people with prohibition found it more rational, more advisable to do away with uh, uh, the Prohibition Act. Now, you see, NBCC must realize that they are not upholding their responsibility where they should be, and they are po poking their nose in areas they are not entitled to. They have no business in working or dictating terms to the government of Nagaland. Hmm? Their duty in real term is to go to every soul in the state and help them build up a Christian value, Christian faith, and when they do this, and you create a born-again community, you see, it is a simple thing. When you are a born-again Christian, you put whiskey in front of him, or vodka, or beer, or any wine in front of a, a born-again Christian. You may place it on the table before him, but that Christian who is reborn will not touch it because he is convinced. And when I am convinced that this is wrong, through the help of the churches, making me understand what is the strength of that Christian faith within which to live by. And once we achieve this, you see, you can tempt the Christians with, uh, with the liquor, but a good Christian will refuse to have it. That is the job of the church, to go to every household, help them to believe drinking is not good for health, it is not good for the community, it is not good for any damn thing. Huh? And once they are able to do their homework and go to the people and create a good, solid Christian society, see, drinking becomes an act of people who are totally out of control and, and they will drink if they have to, but it is still within the control, you see. And, uh, so building up a strong Christian community is more the focus that they should be taking rather than to be dictating terms and threatening the government that they will vote against the, 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 the party that uh, uh, scrubs out the prohibition, you see. They are threatening. But the fact of the reality is even the churches take bribes in the, in the elections. You, they, may, they may feel bad about this. But the church, the people that work in the mission, even they, a good number, yes, it's not, it's not everybody. They are really faithful, sincere people working in the mission. There's no doubt about it. But when we talk of the masses, the churches spread over the whole state. You see, you have the, the, the pastors, the deacons, who are the basic foundry of the church. You see, they are some of the, among the first people that go looking for bribes, selling their votes during the elections, you see, when the church cannot even control its immediate people, 
You see, the question of threatening the government or the party of voting against this, it, it is a hollow threat. Hmm? No matter what happens, if the prohibition is withdrawn, the church can issue dictat to say that this party is the one that withdrew the prohibition. Nothing is going to happen against that party because at the end of the day, the people will sell the votes. Hmm? So church giving dictate is of no consequence. It has no authority. It will not be able to enforce any damn thing. And so the political parties being afraid of the church is nonsense. You see, it is, it is not real. And uh, therefore, when something is hypocritical as bad as this, you see, I think the church should slowly and honorably back out of this and let the government make decisions the way it should be. So I think that they should see certain realities more clearly for the sake of the community. The habitual drinking people, no matter what is the law, have been getting their drinks anywhere and everywhere. Huh? And this kind of a stupidity being carried on without any resolve, even by the state government, I think it's about time that uh, we begin to see reality as reality is and uh, get rid of this stupid NLTP. That's what I say, and NNB, NBCC should get collect themselves in their kitchen and uh, find out exactly what they are trying to cook because they are putting too many salt in other people's curry. Hmm? Too much of salt in somebody else's curry. Hmm? So I think NBCC should also come to their senses and uh, make their uh, perspectives a little more humane, a little more clearer, and understand their duties as well. Uh, talking about the Eastern Nagaland People's Organizations, they have been demanding for the frontier Nagaland. So what is your say on that? Well, you know, uh, right from the beginning, when the state was formed, it began as Naga Hills, Twengsang area. During the British time also, the Eastern Nagaland or the Eastern sector they were not even governed even by the British, you see? And uh, during that period after the British had left, the state was created with uh, a portion of NEFA, as it used to be called, where Tuang San was a part of. And uh, unfortunately, at that point in time, all the Nagas living in NEFA had not been brought in. But uh, in as far as their historical perspective is concerned, in fact, there are more freer Nagas than the Nagas of uh, the state of Nagaland, if it were to be seen historically. And so I should suppose that they have uh, their rights wanting a separation. But the issue here is, why do they want a separation? Huh? Here, the issue is more to do with, because the, the first generation elders among the uh, Eastern Nagas have all been a party to the final decision of joining the state of Nagaland. It is a willful and unthreatened union of Nagas when it all began, you see. And uh, even the... Uh, Eastern Nagas, they have their due respect for the seniors who have done whatever has been done, and they have lived over the decades with the state of Nagaland. And the reason that they are pissed off about is for the overdrawn period of time where the state government has not really taken pointed exercises to ensure that the Eastern Nagaland is also given reasonable uh, support in terms of development, education, and various other infrastructure. They have been kept in the backseat, have had their drawbacks, have not been properly taken care of. And so they have every reason to complain and want to get away from the main corrupted functioning of what is known as the government of Nagaland or the state government. And uh, I, I suppose they have a right to, to ventilate their point of view. But the only thing that I would ask the ENPO people also is this. 
right from the beginning. In fact, they had a serious membership and presence in the assembly right from the beginning. Hmm? Out of the total seat of uh, 60 uh, uh, seats in the, uh, in the assembly, they control at least uh, 20 of it. Hmm? And uh, that's a serious majority, and they could have done anything but everything if they had the kind of people that were sincere and committed and want to develop their own people in the manner that they deserve, you see. They had representatives. They were a part of a government. But they've had ministers. In fact, when it all started, Mr. Aka Mimlong was a minister purely for the ENPO situation like the Eastern Naga people. There was a cabinet post, even for a specific uh, focus on the Eastern Nagaland, you see. And all along, they have had serious amount of total number of ministers in the cabinet all along the road. Now, what were they doing? It's not as if they were totally thrown out into the wild and not looked after. They had their own representative. They had their ministers, you see. What were the ministers doing? Like everybody else, perhaps they have looked after their own individual welfare more than the communities. Where it comes to development, they all ought to have stood together and asked for certain basic infrastructural improvements. They have not been able to do any of it, and they are equally responsible in the backwardness in which they find themselves. They have nobody else to blame. Even they have to take honest responsibility for the fact that their leaders have let them down. Their own Eastern leaders have let them down. So I think here, living together, because you can define yourself as anybody with a political boundary. The fact of the matter is we are all Nagas. And if we can create a more definitive way within which we could create funds and create priorities for equal development that must be carried out and ensure that it is implemented. We should set up a system, in, uh, a, a manner in which to ensure that Eastern people get their share of infrastructure and development, education, medical, every other facility is required. You see, there should be a result. And this movement has been going on for quite some time now. But the state government, under the leadership of whoever, be it uh, uh, Mr. Rio or whoever else, you see, they have never even, they don't seem to have had any serious concern to sit down with the people when the movement had begun to let them see a balanced view in the whole thing without getting so aggressive as they have become now, you see. And the state government has a tremendous responsibility to bear in allowing this cycle of events to evolve, develop, and come to such a stage where now the Eastern people want a frontier state, state, you see? In which case the state of Nagaland would be, you see, equivalent to some big shorts uh, personal property, you see? We are going to become that small. And I think uh, here, the government of Nagaland or the people of Nagaland in general must be able to see a bigger situations within which all of us can live in some kind of a coordinated uh, well-being being taken care of on equal basis. And I think that effort is the one that is required to be made. That's it. Talking about the 20 MLS from the Eastern Tribe, yeah. uh, the ENBO have asked them to resign uh, in support to the frontier Nagaland. So do you actually think the present 20 MLS from the Eastern Tribe will resign from the boss to support the ENBO? Well, with the time closer to the elections, there's very few months left. And so if the pressure is built up, I would believe that the the 20 MLAs uh, could very well resign. Yeah? They, they cannot make too much money within the next uh, three, four months, I should think. No? 
And so since they cannot make money anymore, giving up their position wouldn't be so difficult in order to support their people. If there were five, six years left, I would have said uh, it's impossible. But uh, at this given situation with the election around the corner, uh, I wouldn't uh, feel that it would be such a difficult decision for them to resign in favor of the people because the people will vote against them if they refuse to resign. So I think uh, they are in a tough weekend and I probably think under pressure they will all resign. Thank you so much. It has always been fruitful to have conversation with you and getting to know your opinion and thoughts. Thank you so much for joining with us. That was in conversation with KKSMA retired IS and a social activist. Keep watching Naglen News Network for more news updates. This is Kumbidundi reporting from Timapur with video journalist I'm Jamir.